Okay, welcome everybody. Um, yes, welcome everybody to this uh, to this webinar of the um, uh, Royal Dutch Acad Academy of Science. Uh, we have an interesting program uh, today. Um, <clears throat> um, our Webinar is called uh, the Electricity System Enabler or Barrier of the for the Energy Transition. Uh, we will have uh, three different viewpoints uh, tonight on this uh, on this topic. Um, um, first, uh, Hans Lodweg uh, will present. Um, after him, uh, Peter Palensky, and um, uh, as third speaker, Leonie Reins. And um, we will start with, uh, with, uh, with Han. Han is uh, Director of Asset Management at uh, Enexis, um, one of the three larger distribution system operators in the Netherlands. Um, and he divides his time uh, between that and uh, being a professor at uh, the Eindhoven University of Technology, uh, where he is a professor of smart grids. Um, Han, uh, please, um, um, uh, yeah, uh, start your presentation. The floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Koen, for your uh, kind introduction. So, uh, and thanks for uh, having me here today for contributing uh, to this uh, interesting uh, webinar. Um, I will discuss the Dutch uh, grid operators' approach for addressing the challenges of the energy transition. So first I will briefly explain what the consequences for the grids are with a focus on electricity grids and uh, then uh, we will look into uh, the way uh, the grid operators try to tackle these challenges and uh, to uh, provide uh, electricity grids that are also facilitating the energy transition and certainly not uh, blocking or impeding it as uh, the title of this webinar partly suggested. Um, the consequences of the energy transition, of course, uh, the a main consequence is, is uh, the reduction of greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, it is, of course, completely clear that we want to, um, ex to exhaust less greenhouse uh, uh, gases uh, in order to uh, mitigate uh, climate change. Uh, now, um, what happens is that energy is generated in more sustainable renewable ways. And uh, in this, uh, wind and solar power, particularly in the Netherlands, uh, play an important role. And as a matter of fact, uh, wind turbines and solar panels generate electricity. Uh, so they generate energy, but they do this in the form of electricity uh, because uh, the physical mechanisms that uh, well make the wind turbines and the solar panels work generate electrons uh, easier than they generate uh, hydrogen uh, molecules or methane molecules or liquid fuels as we uh, can buy them at uh, the fueling station. Uh, we see a same development at the load uh, because um, when making energy consumption more sustainable, uh, for instance, for mobility or for heating, this also often implies a shift to electricity in the form of an electric heat pump or in the form of an electric car as we see them ever more nowadays. So both on the energy generation or production side, as well as on the energy consumption side, we see a, sub, uh, a substitution of natural gas and also uh, oil derivatives uh, used for, uh, uh, for instance, for mobility. Uh, we see substitution with electricity as the energy uh, source or the energy carrier of choice. Uh, all these developments lead to uh, significant and substantial changes in the, well, in, in the functioning or in the whole concept of the electric power system. Because in the past, as you see indicated uh, in the left part of this slide, uh, electricity was generated in large power plants, coal-fired or gas-fired, uh, nuclear, not so prevailing in the Netherlands, but for instance in France and some other countries. It, uh, electricity was generated in large volumes. Uh, these large volumes of electricity were uh, 
supplied to the high voltage grids and then from the high voltage grids they trickled down to the medium and the low voltage grid and to ever smaller consumers. And what we see happening now is that uh, as a byproduct of a sustainable electricity generation, also the flows in the grid become much more dynamic because renewable electricity is not typically generated in such large volumes as it is generated in uh, thermal power plants, in conventional large power plants. Uh, the electricity generation becomes more dispersed and distributed, and as a result, it is connected everywhere to the electricity grid, which leads to changing flow patterns in this grid, both with respect to direction of the part of the flow, the energy flow, as well as with respect to the volume that is flowing through the grid. And this is indicated in this slide. Uh, this is. Uh, um, a quantification of the developments I just uh, laid out. On the left hand, you see the installed uh, wind and solar power in our country in megawatts. So, uh, uh, well, seven, eight, nine years ago, uh, solar panels were uh, 10 times uh, smaller in volume than they are nowadays. At the time, it was between one and two gigawatts. Now it is 20 gigawatts and wind power uh, has uh, more or less doubled in the same period of time. Uh, so we now have uh, nearly 30 gigawatts of renewable electricity generation, whereas uh, eight or some eight years ago, we had maybe uh, four or five gigawatts of renewable generation. So this is really an impressive growth, which the electricity grid has so far facilitated. Uh, similar figures apply uh, with respect to uh, consumption. Uh, in the upper right part, you see the number of electric vehicles which has uh, more or less uh, tripled uh, in uh, uh, some three or four years. And also the number of heat pumps, which was in 2015, a technology that hardly existed. And nowadays we have more than a million of heat pumps connected to our grids. So this quantitatively illustrates the developments I just sketched. Uh, this leads to uh, increasing pressure on the grid. This grid can't develop so quickly and so fast as the developments I showed on the last slide. And the result is depicted in, uh, these, in this slide. Uh, you see here a map of the Netherlands. Uh, in the left or in the middle of the slide, in the left uh, picture, you see the situation with respect to load or demand. Uh, in the red part, there is no grid capacity left. In the orange part, it's very scarce. And then, of course, in yellow, there is some capacity left. And when the map is transparent, when it's white, there is still enough capacity. Uh, on the uh, right part of the slide, you same, see the same picture. But then for electricity generation, because generation and demand are in the electricity grid two different things. So you can have a shortage of grid capacity for both. But it can also be the case that you only have a shortage for generation and not for consumption or the other way around. So you need to look at this separately. And therefore, we publish as grid operators two maps, one for the situation with respect to demand and one with respect to the situation for uh, supply or production. Uh, this is caused by the fact that extending the grid is simply much labor. You have to dig. You have to build, uh, you have to, uh, well, to, to do really quite much work to extend the grid and to increase its capacity. Uh, a complication at the, at the, is that the people who are capable and are willing to do this, there is a shortage of uh, technical staff in the Netherlands, uh, which affects not only the grid operators which who try to extend the grid, but also uh, industry uh, and, uh, and, and uh, other um, uh, activities or sectors. And also uh, for larger grid extensions like high voltage overhead lines or like substations, you need quite some time for acquiring the necessary spatial uh, planning uh, permits and also uh, the, 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 the the service, the ground you need, which you need to buy from someone who is, of course, the current owner. Uh, this is um, a, a, a picture which shows the, in the upper half of the picture the average time of a grid extension in different parts of the grid. So from the left to right, we have high voltage to low voltage. 
And uh, you can see that when you want to extend the grid, the time is longer, the higher the voltage level in the grid. A new overhead line can easily last seven to 10 times to build. Uh, in the low voltage, it is rather months, and in the medium voltage, it's something in between. In the lower half of the figure, you see the average realization time, the average lead time for the initiatives for which the grid capacity is required. And the message of this slide is, of course, that for nearly all developments that need grid capacity, the realization time is a half to a third of the time required for the grid extension. So this, of course, goes wrong. If the developments for which the grid is needed go two to three times faster than the time that is needed to reinforce, to extend the grid, and this is, of course, a recipe for the maps as I showed them on the last slide. So what are we trying and going to do about this? We have technical solutions. As grid operators, we develop together with, uh, of course, universities, but also our suppliers, we develop new components and new approaches to extend the grid much quicker than uh, we used to do in the past. So uh, we build grids currently at least two times faster or even three times faster than we did some five or 10 years ago. We have really accelerated, but still we can't keep up with the exponential growth for uh, of demand for grid capacity. Also a technical solution can be batteries and they can be used for peak shaving because a full grid is only full, the capacity is only fully used at say 100 to 200 hours per year. So if we can somehow reduce the load in these 100 to 200 per year, we still have the space in the other periods of time. And as a year has 8,740 hours, uh, there is space uh, for increased utilization of the grid. This is also what we try to do with what we call congestion management. We try to, in, uh, to, to convince connected clients, customers to the grid to reduce their load at peak hours so that in the valleys we can allow more customers and of course we pay them uh, a certain amount of money for this because they have to uh, take action and they may incur costs and of course we need to repay them for this. Also we have a new type of connection contract, not a connection contract where you have your grid capacity 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year, but rather part of the time you don't have grid capacity, but you can use the capacity when it is available. Uh, we are working on integrated business parks with a variety of companies uh, that could locally balance load and supply uh, so that they can help each other in case the grid operator can't help them because there is no capacity. And we also uh, are in intense discussions with governments in order to accelerate the spatial planning procedures so that we also from that perspective can build grids quicker and reinforce and extend at a higher pace. So we are doing as grid operators our utmost to uh, get with the existing grid as far as we can and to extend it as quickly as we can. And this is of course also which, something which poses scientific challenges. Uh, I am very uh, well uh, uh, glad that I can work on these scientific challenges for one day a week because I am a part-time professor in the group of uh, Kuhn, uh, Electrical Energy Systems in Eindhoven. And I am also glad that many other scientists at other universities are also working on these uh, uh, same topics as the remainder of this uh, webinar will, of course, also show. As summarizing, um, there is a rapidly increasing demand and supply in electricity because it substitutes other uh, sources or forms of energy. This results in increasing shortages of grid capacity and increasing congestion that impedes these same developments because they need capacity of the grid, which is ever more scarce. Extending the grid takes time, and the people who are doing this are scarce. So we are also working on the solutions, technological development, alternative contracts, congestion management, as I have mentioned them. And all this ensures that the grid is used more efficiently, get further with the grid you have, 
extend the grid quicker and in the meantime uh, preserve the high reliability we have in our country and to which uh, the economy and the society are used. So it is not acceptable that uh, there is a significant decrease in the reliability level of the grid. And as this is a scientific seminar uh, webinar, I want to uh, uh, end my uh, well presentation with a uh, quoting a colleague of the past who has also worked on the challenges we are facing today. Uh, this is a quote I like very much. The story of electricity is now mainstream, ordinary and exploited, but that main road is no longer promising. It's time for marching across country and jumping over ditches. So I think this very well summarizes my presentation and the situation in which we are currently with the power system, with the power sector. And now the encouraging uh, point here is that this quotation is from some 200 years ago. Uh, and uh, well, this shows that at the time they also had challenges. They had managed to survive. And I am convinced that we will also manage to survive if we work hard and cooperate as uh, science and industry on the challenges that I have just described we are currently facing in the power system. And with that, I think we go back to Kuhn. Yes, Han, thank you very much for this, uh, this nice overview. Um, really interesting um, about uh, people having questions. People, uh, we will take the questions in the discussion uh, at the end of this, um, this webinar after we have had the, um, uh, the different presentations. Um, and you can, if you're in the, in the Zoom environment, uh, there's a Q&A button. Uh, where you can, uh, if you hit that, you can type your uh, question in the in the chat. Um, there is also um, um, a YouTube channel of um, uh, the Academy, and um, this webinar will also the recording of that webinar is also available after the webinar there. Uh, and if you're now in the channel, you can also uh, watch us live, but you don't have the option uh, to enter questions for the for the Q&A. OK, having uh, had this uh, nice uh, introduction and overview of Han about uh, what uh, the current state of the of the grid is and what um, <clears throat> science technology um, is developed uh, to uh, solve the, the, the short-term problems that we now have. Uh, now we move to uh, Peter Palensky, who is uh, both professor and head of the department um, of electrical sustainable energy at the Delft University of Technology. And he is going to uh, look more into the future, uh, talking about uh, future proofing uh, our electricity system. Thanks, Kuhn. Thanks, everybody, for joining today. Um, I get slight assistance from Martin, I guess. Um, yeah, thanks also, Han, for the for the uh, overview of our challenges. Um, I will talk a bit. I do a bit of, of a deep dive on these things, and and uh, I will I will present you potential uh, solutions for for our challenges. So next slide, please. Yeah, thanks. So there is, so if we assume a, a one hundred percent uh, renewable system, of course, this is this is radical, huh? but that's. Uh, that's basically what it boils down to in the end, if you don't have uh, hydropower stations uh, like here in the Netherlands. So what, what we'll face is, is a lot of problems and, and blockers. I've just picked four rather technical ones. There is much more the regulatory and the market mechanisms uh, are maybe not suitable for these kinds of uh, electricity system. But I, I picked four tech uh, technology aspects. The first one is we, we might need technology upgrades. So the existing infrastructure, what we have out there, um, uh, is was not designed uh, for uh, these kinds of uh, renewable systems. Second one is line loading was already mentioned. Uh, we we need more capacity. 
And the third problem is maybe not so known. It's it's similar to line loading, but it's also voltage problems that we have uh, in a in a in a power system where the individuals, uh, the customers, the former customers, are um, playing a more active role. And the fourth one is about stability. That's also a, a dirty little secret of renewables that uh, the average commons are not aware of. Um, in this case, I will I will shed a light on the inertia problems that we might have if we really go for completely uh, wind and solar based electricity system. Next slide, please. So we've seen this picture already. Um, tech upgrades, um, they are motivated by many, many phenomena. One of them is the bi-directional uh, nature that our grid gets. Uh, so from this tree structure where energy flows in one direction, we go to a more uh, bi-directional uh, thing that requires changes in, in, in every uh, substation. There is a protection systems uh, that, uh, that detect faults and disconnect um, the short circuit uh, segment uh, automatically. They assume a unidirectional power flow uh, if we have bi-directional ones, then we need much smarter systems that uh, can deal with these situations. Um, currently, this is not the case. And uh, companies like Nexus are now busy <laughs> in upgrading their systems to, to be prepared for these situations. Um, same with controls. Um, we need a much more agile um, way of running our systems, especially on the distribution level, active distribution networks, where you act with... Uh, uh, where you interact with uh, active players on the grid edge, uh, smart loads, generation units in the field. Um, you would like to maybe aggregate these things and provide services to the transmission system operator. So that's a new role. Uh, the distribution system companies have to reinvent themselves. So the the foundations of their of their uh, uh, business logic is is changed. So they also have to restructure and be a very much system operator company. Um, we will install lots of storage. That's obvious, yeah, the, the sun doesn't shine in the night. We have just found out. Um, there's also uh, 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 weather and seasons uh, that, that uh, dominate our renewable production. So we have to store everywhere on household level, on substation level, on national level, different technologies. They will also change over the decades. We might have DC direct current systems, which have uh, lots of advantages, but also some challenges. But in the end, we will enable all these these tech upgrades with lots of smartness, yeah? machine learning and AI. So this is uh, one of the uh, mainstreams that we will uh, experience the next ten to twenty years. That we have these tech upgrades in the grid doesn't make things easier, as you can imagine. Next slide, please. The second problem was line loading. We had this already with uh, um, loads and generation. Um, one solution, of course, is more capacity, more copper, more aluminium. This is always good. Uh, this is a good investment to, to increase the capacity. It's not always possible. You cannot put infinite cables into the ground. There is not enough space. It costs lots of money. It takes a long time, as we have just learned. Um, this is on local level, on the distribution system, but also on the national level, so the Right picture is what Tenet has slammed on the table as the target grid, basically saying, if you want renewable energy everywhere, yeah, then you need this grid or something similar with lots of high voltage DC corridors, with lots of capacity improvement, with lots of offshore wind, with energy hubs and so forth. So this picture is really, yeah, it's honest, yeah, but it's radical. Yeah? It tells you what you really need as infrastructure if you want to go green. Yeah? If you want to go green, you need that. And it, we have to start now building to have it ready when we need it. That's one thing, capacity. But another option is smartness. You, know, you can uh, have flexible topologies. You can have smart operations. You can use the storage that we will need anyway in a smarter way. You can have integrated energy, uh, gas, heat, electricity, transport, built environment, markets. All these sectors and systems can be connected with smartness, with digital systems, with the digital transformation. And by that, um, leverage uh, flexibility and other things that we need in order to fix uh, problem number two, line loading. So it's both physical and both smartness will be needed. Yeah. Next slide, please. The third one was voltage. Um, 
by law, every customer is equal. <laughs> you have the same right, the same connection rights. But if you're further away from the connection point from the substation, you will have a, a slightly worse um, supply situation in terms of voltage. Classically, when people were consuming, uh, the voltage was going down. The further downstream you go into the into the distribution feeder. Now, when we also feed in with photovoltaics, um, this might change and also be raised. So this is getting really complex and we have to provide fairness so that everybody gets the same service and the same rights, but it's not only not always happening. Yeah? Maybe your, your neighbor still could connect photovoltaic panels on the roof, but you not anymore yeah? because uh, the voltage is at, at its limit. And that's not nice. Huh? So we have to see how 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 the situation is. We need more sensors, more insights. Uh, is it always the case? Or maybe just a few hours per year, then we can make a smart solution with limiting and balancing. So all these things, again, similar to the number two, uh, 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 require a bit of smartness. Um, of course, also physical extension. A thicker cable always helps. Um, but you can maybe operate the generation units, the batteries, the loads and so on, in a way that you can operate the system more at its limits and provide fairness and more capacity to everybody. Next slide, please. The fourth uh, blocker was uh, stability, in this case, system inertia. As you might know, the dirty old coal plants uh, were stabilizing the grid with its uh, um, rotating masses of the generators. These generators were autonomously providing stability. So if there's a shockwave in the grid, they were just swallowing it. They were riding through it because of their sheer mass. If we now replace caloric units with renewables, which have basically no inertia at all in photovoltaics, there is no rotation <laughs> and in the wind farms. It's too small and it's connected via power electronics. Um, uh, then, we, when, then we lose this stabilizing effect. Uh, so unfortunately, we add troublemakers, uh, the renewable energy, and we remove the troubleshooters, the dirty coal plants. This combination is a bit unfortunate. And that's, again, something where a bit of smartness can help. So we have done quite some uh, projects with our grid company partners where these troublemakers, yeah, the power electronically connected assets, and basically that's everything. The, the, your car is connected with power electronics, or your heat pump, your batteries, your photovoltaic panels, the wind farms, all connected with this no inertia power electronics. We can turn the table around and make a troubleshooter out of the troublemaker. Yeah? These assets have flexibility, the bit of communication and smartness. We can uh, make a hydrolyzer or other assets in the grid as a trouble. Shooter. Next slide, please. I give you examples now. One uh, here is in Amsterdam. We had a look at a at a neighborhood that was full. Yeah, the substation was full. The capacity was reserved, so could, you could couldn't build anything anymore. And together with uh, the local grid company, in this case Alianda, we had a look at the details and looked how how serious it really is because grid extension is maybe in two three years. The substation will be upgraded, but until then. No new house, no new building, no new factory can be built there. That was the problem. Next slide, please. So we had um, detailed modeling, lots of data-driven machine learning supported, but also lots of handwork, lots of manual work was done uh, to make detailed models to see how serious it is, when and how. Lots of data was needed. Again, data is a bit of a help. If you operate blindly, you don't know what to fix and how. And in this case, uh, we, we found solutions uh, uh, with uh, an alternative line, with a battery here, generator there. You can fix the problem. And by that, uh, bridge the two or three years uh, of operations until the substation is extended anyway. So it buys you time to know more details and to look into the, into the uh, bare figures of the, of the system. Next slide, please. The second example is uh, voltage control. I've, that was the problem number three. Here you see a distribution feeder and uh, one of the feeders, um, I think it's number 15 or so, it's a troublemaker. Uh, let's say Kun Kok lives there and he comes home with his uh, electric Ferrari and plugs it in. Then he drags down the voltage massively and everybody suffers and maybe even violates some grid constraints. That's the red line here. And by that triggers some protection maybe and the entire neighborhood goes dark. Yeah. So that's, uh, of course, that is future. 
Um, but it will come. Uh, the more we, we electrify our, our lives, the more these grids come under pressure and we have to be prepared. Um, next slide, please. And one of the options is to go a bit into self-organization so that uh, everybody that's in, in the grid uh, can contribute to the solution. So if you see there is a problem, maybe the neighbors can fix it. Maybe they can raise the voltage with more generation and so forth. So we are um, developing yeah, fractal self-organizing algorithm that try to fix the problem in the field, yeah? not to escalate it to the control room, but maybe it's solvable locally. Maybe there will be some compensation, some payment involved. Uh, if you help each other as a neighborhood, uh, then uh, in the past you gave some apples or some eggs <laughs> for helping each other. Now you can do this on the grid as well. Next slide, please. Um, what could happen uh, is that some of these neighbors are cheating, that they are playing games, that they maybe uh, have a problem, that they don't behave properly anymore. And that's exactly what research is now looking at, how stable are these algorithms, how, 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 how inert and how immune uh, against problems can this, can this be done in a self-organizing way. This is mathematically very, very um, uh, fascinating. And honestly, we have now methods at our, in our hands that we didn't have 10 years ago. Next slide, please. Um, last example is uh, a few smartness things. So we go a lot into digital twins. This is basically digital replicas, models of, of, of your assets, of your systems, and you can consult them to, to, to make planning decisions and operational decisions. You can fast forward them into the future and see how my multiverse in the next months and years looks like. Where should I invest? What should I prepare for? Um, there's lots of open points, but we have many projects running on that uh, now, even on European level with the EU power system twin has 77 partners. So it's massive. So everybody's looking into that, DSOs, TSOs, and, and research institutes in Europe to uh, get that. That is one of the tools uh, uh, operational. Next slide, please. Offshore is also a lot of uh, things happening um, to fix problems. Uh, one of the magic um, ingredients is multi-terminal high voltage DC connections. That sounds complicated, but it's basically a mesh of DC networks offshore. You need very fast controllers, uh, new components that are not existing yet, but uh, it be behaves better than, uh, than uh, existing ones. Next slide, please. I have to speed up. Kuhn is looking at me. We're also investing in the control rooms uh, with our grid uh, companies, uh, with our partners. We are developing new ways of uh, improving cyber resiliency. So we're hacking each other. We are training people. We're trying to identify a cybersecurity breach and the ways how to get out of it and how to recover quickly. Again, smartness is needed. Next slide, please. That's the last example of smartness. Uh, machine learning, you have seen in the last five to seven years, we were given fantastic tools in our hands. Uh, they came from the Twitters and, and Facebooks, of course, but we are now abusing them for physical systems, for machine uh, controls, for uh, power systems. And uh, the, the, the results are fantastic. We, we can now do things that we couldn't do uh, in the past in terms of uh, controlling, uh, optimizing, and, and analyzing grids together with our industry partner again. Next slide, please. I think that's the last. So as you see, there are challenges. I'll go if you four uh, technical ones, but there are also solutions. They take time, as we have seen from Han in the first uh, uh, presentation, but we have to start be yeah? better yesterday than today. Uh, we need capacity ex expansion, that's clear. We need storage everywhere. We need smartness, flexibility. We need active grids uh, that are more agile, that are at the counter uh, weights to the agile environment that we are uh, embedded. But there is no silver bullet. Yeah? If anybody promises you there is one technology that saves it all and that will make us happy, don't believe that. We need a puzzle piece of multiple technologies and multiple principles and that might even change over time. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much, Peter, for this um, interesting overview. Um, really inspiring. Thanks for that. Um, <clears throat> so now, um, yeah, we have had um, two more technical viewpoints. One uh, on, the, on the on the actual situation and the shorter term, and one uh, more looking ahead. 
And now we, we move to a completely different angle, um, uh, the angle of, uh, of, uh, of public law. Um, and uh, so we have here uh, Professor Leonie Reins, uh, who is a professor of public law and sustainability at the Erasmus School of Law. Um, and she will uh, look into how our current market rules can slash need to support new market realities. Leonie, I'm curious to find out what you're gonna tell us. Thank you very much, Kuhn, for this introduction. Actually, I will be uh, talking about the five, the fifth roadblock in uh, Peter's terminology, namely the law and uh, the regulation. So thank you for this very um, nice uh, bridge. So on how uh, the new current market rules can or need to support the new market realities, um, I guess it's first worth delving into what is the market realities and the previous speakers have very nicely done this. So what can we observe here that there are actually two transitions in parallel in the physical world, but also in the legal world, if you want to put it like that. So the first one is uh, the energy and transition, the move from fossil fuels to renewable energy. It has been mentioned uh, the like that electrification is a, a big um, aspect of this. Um, and on the energy legislation and uh, energy um, transition in general, we have a lot of legislation that is, for example, energy efficiency, um, but also the targets that we have on the national level and the international level as well. Um, and generally the move from yeah, fossil fuels to renewable energy. For electrification, we also have uh, increasing more rules and regulations. Um, mobility is one of the biggest um, yeah, blocks of legislation that we have, uh, but also um, yeah, the, the central heating uh, at home as an important cornerstone of the energy transition. And that, as we've already heard, uh, leads to imbalances um, between supply and use. And also, and this could at some point turn into a legal question uh, as well. Um, this leads to, for example, policies such as Fund Upon, where clients uh, in the end receive less money back when they feed their energy back um, into the grid. And it has already been said that uh, some consumers didn't uh, agree uh, with this uh, and are seeking into um, whether they can take actually legal measures against this. But then um, also, um, yeah, nicely explained by the previous speakers, the, the digital um, transition that consumers are being able to produce energy themselves, they feed it into the grid, they trade it peer to peer is something that is also increasing, having increased, um, yeah, uh, measures um, for law and then also energy and um, smart systems so uh, when you turn on your laundry dishwasher etc so we have heard that the uh, legal infrastructure was not uh, really made uh, for this yet uh, the, the infrastructure was not made built for this but also the legal system is not really made uh, for us so what are actually the current market rules? And no worries, I will not bother you with nitty gritty details yet. I think I will start with the, the statement that energy law and electricity law um, also more specifically is actually a firefighter uh, discipline. So it's really focusing um, on problems as they emerge. Most recently, for example, the emergency measures um, as after the um, Russian invasion of Ukraine and the high energy prices. Uh, but also this has been um, the case in the past. So there's a, a problem uh, and there's a legal solution needed. Another example is, for example, um, that at some point we decided to unbundle uh, the energy systems or separate um, production from transmission and distribution. So again, a problem and a quick, at best, uh, legal solution. So there are no really underlying values and directions that energy or electricity law has as a discipline. And that is why also it's not really um, future oriented, but also keeps on solving uh, those fires and problems as they emerged. And uh, just as the energy system today, which is still rather linear and one directional, you can also say that the underlying regulatory system is based on mainly three pillars. 
uh, which is um, the targets that I've already mentioned, uh, renewable energy targets that the Netherlands, but also all member states uh, have, the climate uh, neutrality target in 5050, which is also included in EU law. Uh, then the second pillar of markets, I've already mentioned in bundling, but also carbon pricing and taxation, and obviously a big challenge of creating, creating a market uh, for renewable energy. And then uh, the sector specific regulation, and um, that is, yeah, um, focused on specific technologies, such as, for example, hydrogen um, or energy efficiency in buildings, uh, transportation. There are, um, yeah, lots of sector specific legislation. So, in line uh, with the idea to create a future integrated energy system technically, as also the previous speakers have uh, pointed out. Um, we also um, need an integra integrated legal system. And for a better picture, I've just uh, put this um, uh, well, wool here. Um, so we need an integrated legal system, which is um, able to adapt uh, yeah, those challenges. But how do we actually do that? And it's not uh, so easy. Otherwise, it might have already uh, been there. That is because law uh, and legislation itself is a challenging discipline. And uh, legislation is slow uh, and solutions are needed for now. Actually, this is now the third time that you've seen this picture, um, for example, to address congestion management are um, needed uh, fast. But legislation is slow. That is also because a lot is actually expected uh, from the law. It um, yeah, should stimulate technology, technological innovation. It should protect the consumers. It should support business. And it also should um, address un potential un unintended uh, consequences that uh, comes with the law. So actually, the assumption that was there for quite, quite a while, uh, that regulation and legislation can be drafted slowly, deliberately, and remain in place unchanged for a long period of time, is not true anymore uh, in today's rapid development of new technologies, also as we see them um, in the electricity sector and the energy sector more broadly. So the um, oversight of um, emerging technologies is more complex than uh, previous regulatory uh, challenges also in the energy uh, sector. Think about the two parallel transitions. Um, in the because technologies um, yeah, tend to have many diverse applications and forms. They're used in different uh, contexts. And uh, they are also um, approached by multiple stakeholders. Um, think about the examples that uh, the previous speakers uh, have mentioned. Um, for example, um, the people who are affected by the long voltage lines, et cetera, et cetera. So technologies um, often fail to fit comfortably within existing uh, regulatory categories. And thus something that we lawyers call path dependency um, becomes increasingly a problem because the regulatory frameworks are developed for earlier and simpler um, technologies. And that can be problematic. One example in the electricity sector is uh, um, that uh, until actually now, uh, there was separate legislation for gas and electricity, as it's often very much done. And only in the last years, uh, it had actually really showed that um, it's not possible to deal with those challenges uh, in two separate paths anymore. And the path needs to be broken. And this is now what uh, uh, the um, draft in a, in a HEVAT energy law is now trying to do. It's uh, trying to replace the electricity and the gas law into a new combined energy law. So how do we then actually adapt the current market rules uh, to support new market realities? Uh, and not everything is bad. Peter already gave us some hopes and there's also some hopes from the, from the legal um, perspective in the sense that scientists in law um, have studied this problem of, for quite some time now and came up with uh, different uh, ideas. Um, one is, for example, the um, public value framework from Irene Niet and her colleagues. Um, Irene is based in Eindhoven. 
Um, so um, she, com yeah, she creates a so-called um, or suggests the creation of a public value framework, which combines public values from the energy field, such as sustainability, reliability and affordability with those of uh, digitalization, privacy, cybersecurity, and then also other public values such as um, yeah, control over technology and autonomy. Another um, framework or approach um, that has been developed uh, in, in academic literature is the one uh, of good governance principles by my colleague Saskia Labreisen in, in uh, Tilburg. Um, she says that there should be certain uh, principles that should be reflected when drafting legislation. And these are, as you can see here on the slide, accountability, independence, uh, transparency, and um, participation. And then uh, a last example in this regard is um, the triars that has been uh, developed by uh, Ruven Fleming from um, Groninger and uh, myself and uh, a colleague of ours, Kaiser Huda from Finland, is the triers. And this departs from the perspective that there are actually three type um, of norms, which is nothing new. So they are rules, principles, and objectives. And a rule is setting forth a precise solution for specific facts. And once the conditions for applications have been fulfilled, it leads to a clear legal solution. So pretty much straightforward. Then a principle, by contrast, is more providing general orientation and direction for rules. And principles are hence a bit more abstract and guiding policy measures, but their um, concrete implement implementation can actually only be done um, by rules. Uh, and also due to this different nature, principles allow for a lot more discretion than rules. And it's, for example, suggested that um, sustainable development would be a fitting principle uh, for uh, the development of the energy and also the electricity sector. And then there's a third category, uh, namely objectives. And objectives are even more abstract than principles and provide general orientation for the decision maker so that the, the ones that actually uh, create uh, the law, uh, they often cannot be regarded as fulfilled or unfulfilled uh, for the same way uh, as rules. And what all these three approaches actually have in common um, is that there is general agreement on the principles that uh, should be reflected in, in the legislation and also the overarching uh, objectives of energy justice and energy democracy, as you can uh, see here on these slides. What does that actually mean? There is no explicit definition of energy justice um, in any of the member states legislation, but also not in uh, EU law, but you could generally say from um, scholarship also that this is based on three pillars. First of all, distributed just, uh, justice, so the consideration of, a fair, of the fair allocation of burdens and benefits to the energy system, so who receives uh, what. Then recognition and justice, um, so the fair representation of those um, who are affected, um, Vulnerable consumers, um, for example, who suffer from high electricity prices is a good example um, from the energy sector. And then also procedural justice. Um, so that relates to the decision making um, process. So um, how the decisions um, are made and actually who is included in the decision making. So there's uh, agreement on that. But what remains difficult uh, are the concrete rules. Um, and let me uh, briefly uh, conclude with looking at uh, the rules, namely the Karen Wettfostel Energie um, Wet. So this is not uh, going to be in depth because the, the legislative proposal is already uh, 400 uh, pages long. And actually, just last week, there was a technical briefing uh, um, and the um, scientific test. So the Wittenskapstuts, um, where my colleague Saskia Lavreisen um, from Tilt and Tilburg and Michiel Möders from Groningen were actually in the Tweede Kammer. And they have made uh, some recommendations. I'm not going to um, go through them um, all. Um, but having re regard to what I said earlier regarding the overarching principles and objectives, um, 
energy justice and energy democracy in mind, um, one can say already that um, one of the things that is not good in the current energy act to embrace the new market realities is that the Netherlands uh, have not included a definition of vulnerable consumer into the legislation, even though this is asked for by the European member states. And criteria for this are arguably um, how much of the disposable income can be spent on energy, um, the energy efficiency of home, um, electrical equipment, et cetera, et cetera. So member states are required to include this, and this is something that the, mem uh, that, uh, the Dutch uh, in a HIVAC currently lacks. I've already highlighted the um, data governance, uh, the digital transition, so um, the energy transition coupled with the digital ones, and data governance is also an important aspect um, of the draft um, in the HIVET, but there should be more explicit information on which data can be uh, collected uh, and shared. And then a last example, because Kuhn already turned on his camera, which is a sign that I need to brief up, uh, is that there are no monitoring and evaluation requirements included in the law. And this is precisely because of the, the things that I've told earlier, the fast development of the technology and the fact that law is already lacking behind uh, quite a lot. It is important to obviously um, closely monitor and evaluate um, the um, in and give it also um, with the long term objectives of 2030 and 2050. So I hope you understood a bit better uh, what the, the dilemmas are and why it's so difficult to adapt the law to the um, new market realities. And I also hope that I gave you, um, taking the words of Peter, uh, some fixes, even though qu quick fixes of how uh, the challenges could be overcome. Thank you very much. And here I think are some references, um, but that's probably the academic in me. Um, yeah, I can stop share. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Leonie. Um, and you know, after all, it's um, it's a webinar of the um, Royal Academy of Sciences, so um, reference are uh, references are always uh, uh, in place here. Um, yeah, we, with that, uh, we uh, so we uh, concluded the last one of three very interesting uh, presentations. Uh, I learned a lot uh, also myself. Um, I haven't mentioned it, but most people will know uh, that I'm a professor of uh, intelligent energy systems uh, at the Eindhoven University of Technology. Uh, and I said I learned a lot. So one thing that I, uh, that I learned that there is an uh, electric Ferrari somewhere in my future. Um, so I'm very pleased uh, to, to, to get them. <laughs> We're waiting for the moment that uh, that it will uh, will stop uh, at my front door. Um, so there are, is now time for uh, for questions. Uh, already, as some people have um, uh, asked us some questions. Already, Han also um, uh, already answered some. I think the. If the questions are answered, they are they are visible for uh, for all of us, so you can check that. Uh, but we, we, I think, some of these questions are also um, interesting uh, to uh, to 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 look at. Uh, the questions are sometimes also quite high level, and you can also see that we are in a in a webinar of the of the Royal Academy. Uh, so this is uh, this is uh, quite nice. Um, First uh, question to you, Han, you already uh, uh, wrote an answer, but it's probably good to discuss it as well, uh, comes from uh, Paul Giesbertz, um, and he asked about uh, the special contract for non-firm capacity, and his answer is where, whether just normal contracts in combination with uh, mechanisms or contracts for congestion management, if that would not be equally effective. And of course, we also have mechanisms for uh, congestion management in place in the Netherlands. Yeah, I think uh, in principle, Paul is right, as I already indicated in my answer. I think uh, from a, a, a grid operator or, or maybe technical point of view, 
uh, what you want to achieve is that at peak moments, uh, no additional flows are introduced in your grid because you don't have the capacity. And this technical goal can, I think, indeed be achieved in different ways. And one way is a non-firm connection tract contract, which prohibits you to be on the grid uh, when there is a peak uh, moment. Uh, and a combination of a regular contract with a, con a congestion uh, management contract more or less does the same. Again, it prevents you from being on the grid with electrons when there is no capacity in the grid left. Uh, but of course, uh, there's more about this than technology. Uh, there's also uh, customer preferences and, uh, uh, and, and convictions. And what we see in practice that some people, as they do not know much about congestion management, uh, and also because it's a little bit a complicated uh, approach, they prefer to have a contract which gives them certainty, both on the availability of capacity as well as on the financial aspects of the contract, which are also not, well, more certain with a non-firm contract than with congestion management. And uh, well, of course, we could argue with the consumer if he or she wishes for the right thing, uh, as uh, is uh, more or less the direction Paul is uh, uh, heading for. Uh, well, we prefer simply if this is the question of the customer and it could help us with our congestion, we try to answer this question and to uh, well to to offer alternative solutions maybe for the same goal. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, uh, Han, for that answer. Um, also, you know, listening to the stories, of course, we had a really nice different viewpoints, and I think we could fill a whole day with uh, fifteen minutes uh, talks with uh, with different viewpoints. One viewpoint that we missed is, for instance, the business uh, point of view, uh, and one thing that that became apparent to me is about uh, the, the 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 business of of a smart grid technology for the grid itself. Um, I have been lucky enough to be in uh, to have been part of a of a pioneering group uh, in smart grids at uh, the time at my time at ECN, and then we worked on what we now call aggregation, uh, virtual power plants was the was the buzzword back then, and then we also did some uh, some business case uh, calculations, and with with. Um, aggregation and then uh, delivering um, 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 uh, frequency reserves, for instance, you have a business case every 15 minutes. So every 15 minutes, you have an opportunity to make a little bit of money and then it adds up. Um, when you look at uh, business cases for congestion management, yeah, then uh, the grid operation operator does an investment for, uh, for 40 years. Um, and then you, you can decide to, uh, to make the cable uh, thicker. Um, and then when it's in the ground and it's, and it's thick enough, then there's no problem. So there's only one business case every 40 years. And that, that made that calculation quite hard. But now suddenly uh, the business case for congestion management is not the investment deferring of the, of the grid operator, but it's, but it's the... The, the, the economic growth that we that we temper, um, um, be, yeah, be, be, because uh, companies and uh, and customers cannot uh, get a new connection or get an increase of that connection. Um, um, yeah, maybe it's a question of of the three of you. Is there somebody that can reflect on that uh, on that viewpoint? Am I right in that? Who do you want to comment, uh, Yeah, whoever uh, wants yeah, to well, jump Because in. I had already a question, I think maybe one of the other uh, presenters can uh, give uh, the first answer. Yeah, maybe it's closer, closest to your practice, although I see also Leonie having a... Um... No, okay. So what yeah. was, could you briefly rephrase the question? Because, uh, well, it was certainly an, 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 a point of view I reckon nice, I think, but what the question was not fully clear to me, but you were yeah, we, for the topic we, of Yeah, it was more like an observation that I wanted to check with you. So we always did uh, business case analysis for yeah. congestion management based on 
great investment and then deferred costs. While now in reality, the, 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 the reference case uh, to calculate it against is, uh, is uh, less economic growth because yeah. of... Uh, yeah, that's certainly true. This is certainly true. So uh, when we apply congestion management, this is certainly not something that we balance against the cost of the investment and then conclude that the investment would be cheaper because the investment takes us three, five, or even 10 years. And in these 10 years, uh, well, every development is more or less stopped due to a lack of uh, grid capacity. Uh, so uh, we have an obligation as grid operators, and I think that is certainly justified. We have an obligation to use and apply congestion management when there is no grid capacity available under a regular condition. So this has nothing to do with making some balance between cost and benefit. This is simply an obligation that we need to, to do uh, when we have a lack of grid capacity and there's still demand for capacity. Our current problem is, however, that for applying congestion management, we need customers that offer somehow flexibility, which we can use within the framework of congestion management. And so far, uh, well, there is not so much flexibility offered to the grid operators to use in congestion management. So this is a topic we discuss with parties that are connected to our grids. Yep. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Um, then there is a question for Peter about uh, the technical solution that you showed uh, to solve congestion uh, with local flex and batteries. Uh, to overcome a local congestion until the, the, the grid can be expanded. Um, and the question is, wouldn't it be simpler to organize a tender so that the market could provide uh, such a solution? Well, the question is, which, which market and which market players? It's a local problem in this case. So if the if the solution is in 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 in, in Friesland and the problem is in, in Zeeland, uh, that that won't work in in this case. So it must be something local. Um, the problem in that particular project was that nobody knew if and how to fix things. Huh? It was just clear that the capacity that was allocated at the substation was full. Huh? So there were housing projects, there were offices and factories, and um, that was consumed. In the end, the question was, um, how is the dynamic situation? Are they all really consuming at the same time, which is the worst case, which is reflected in the capacity allocation of the substation? Or can we do something? Maybe it's not so bad in the first place, but maybe it is still bad, but we can shift them around somehow or we can support with the storage here and the generator there. So that was the situation. The moment you know that, of course, you can go into a tender and ask uh, maybe an, an open data exercise. So, guys, this is the problem. Transparency So the grid operator maybe says, this is my problem. Everybody that is on, the, on that feeder can, can maybe uh, contribute to a solution. Uh, I'm 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 waiting for bids. Yeah? <laughs> who who does what, and, and then I I can compensate you for that or something. That is that is indeed a business uh, logic that uh, would need to be done later. That was not in our case. We just tried to get the the data for the grid operator to to get more insight to see how far can we go. Maybe something can can be done to to bridge that time until the capacity expansion is really implemented. Okay, thank you. Um, then I think this one is for Leonie. Um, might be a short, short answer. Uh, so the, the 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 question is about this uh, this uh, infeeding of uh, of PV uh, um, uh, energy. Um, and so you mentioned Van der Bron uh, now uh, now charging uh, clients. Would it not be better to stop the salderingsregeling? I think um, that is, I don't know. Um, other member states have, um, um, yeah, uh, 
yeah, um, experimented with different models. All the models have um, its own pros uh, and cons. Um, I think the Netherlands, at least the Saldings Riesling is relatively easy. Um, in, in Germany, the experiments were uh, a lot more complicated. So um, I think in the end, it's a political choice, to be honest. For law, it doesn't really make uh, such such a difference. I don't know whether it makes a, a technical difference. Yeah. Uh, the others can. Uh, yeah, and it's probably maybe, also yeah. a market uh, question because yeah. we now pay uh, the full price for uh, power, which is produced at a, at a at a time of the day when also prices are negative because of the because of the the same infeed. Um, so it's not uh, it's not price reflective anymore. Um, and I think I, I think you can conclude that this uh, that this uh, um, subsidy has done its job, and it's now time to uh, to move on to each other, something else. I saw also uh, Han typing an answer to that uh, to that question, which is pr probably in the same uh, line. Um, um, then. Um, yeah, there's a remark um, because of the title of the of the session. Uh, Adrian thought, okay, are we also going to talk about uh, about other energy carriers? Um, but we focused really on uh, on uh, on electricity, um, uh, and um, yeah, can we say something about uh, the heat? Um, from uh, from solar panels uh, and how that would impact uh, the puzzle with uh, with with the grid. So heat from solar panels is solar thermal. Yes, solar thermal yes. collectors. Yes. No, oh, they make heat when I don't need it. Um, I can use it for the shower in summer, but in winter there is almost no production. Storing it is possible. Um, uh, there were uh, model houses built with uh, hot water tanks, massively insulated uh, with polyurethane foam. And, and it works. You really produce the heat in the summer that you can use later in the winter for low temperature heating, uh, floor heating. Um, I think it's smart. It's simple. Uh, it, it needs space. That's the point. Uh, it needs quite some space. That's in urban uh, environments. And let's face it, we, we are urbanizing everywhere. Uh, difficult, um, uh, but uh, on the other side, yeah, it's it's a charming solution uh, if you don't have to convert it a lot. Yeah, the moment you have to convert back and forth, you always lose something, and uh, more infrastructure is involved, and more things can break. Solar thermal system uh, would would be an alternative, but in the end, it's really a localized question. So every neighborhood and maybe even every house has maybe an optimum. Huh? What is available as resources? What is possible? Whereas by break even point, sometimes an electric heater, which is terrible, of course, maybe it's the best solution compared to others. You never know. You really have to look case by case. Um, but I would never, ever exclude solar thermal. Yeah? Sometimes it's, it's the best solution. Sometimes. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Um... Then I have also a question for Leonie. Um, yeah, you talked about uh, about um, the, the um, um, yeah legislation is more like firefighting. Um, um, you also talked about you know speeds in technology technology developments and speeds in uh, in in changing uh, regulations and laws. Um, uh, and you had s something about uh, about pathways. Yeah. How how, how we, are we going to solve this uh, yeah. this this puzzle? Yeah. I think that actually also relates a bit to one of the questions. If I take them together with this here in the in the chat uh, on um, whether for every uh, technology we need a new legislation. Um, and uh, I think this is something precisely that uh, students always jump to. So if an, there's a new problem. Uh, we need new legislation. If there's a new technology, we need new legislation. Uh, so I think that is uh, the beginning, the beginning uh, of uh, how you would uh, think you should solve a problem. And this is precisely indeed how not to do it. So you need to 
first before creating new legislation for new um, specific problem um, see on how you can adopt the current market rules to to uh, accommodate uh, this problem and i think uh, one of the solutions uh, for this is um, to create yeah, legislation that is more based on values as principles, such as also those um, frameworks uh, suggest, um, so that uh, they are um, yeah more encompassing in terms of technologies. That that's only one technology that can fall under it. And um, that's also often called um, principle-based uh, um, legislation, so that you go away from strict uh, thresholds, such as for example numbers of sizes to um, more qualitative uh, terms and experimental uh, regulation where you set certain, for example, sandboxes where you exclude um, yeah, specific parts. Um, Hans example in, um, in Amsterdam could have, for example, been such a regulatory sandbox where you say the legislation doesn't apply uh, at the moment because we need to experiment with permits, et cetera, et cetera. One of the um challenges of this is if you um have more principle based regulation so not so precise is the enforceability and the legal certainty uh, because then it becomes a discussion which it shouldn't whether you have um, complied with the law or not so again there is no easy fix there's a lot of discussion how you can actually uh um, yeah, break these problems of uh, the the speed, uh, and I think yeah, um, principle based legislation is one of the the key uh, suggestions there. But again, uh, unfortunately, um, contrary to Peter's problems, there's no uh, quick fix uh, for that one. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Um, then I think this is a more technical one. Uh, the, um, um, a question about uh, about storage. Um, of course, a lot of a lot of uh, challenges that we have in electricity is that we do not have uh, utility uh, uh, sized uh, storage, so large scale storage, um, and so we always need to um, have other means of uh, getting demand and supply. Uh, in balance, uh, close to real time. Um, how do we see future development developing? How we see now batteries being introduced for uh, for a different storage on different time scales, um, and we also need um, to uh, match demand and supply on different time scales. Also, I think seasonal uh, differences. Um, we already mentioned uh, with uh, with uh, with the heat, uh, winter and summer, but uh, that's also with uh, with electricity production, of course. Uh, well, how do we have a vision? How 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 do we expect um, storage or other forms of demand supply matching developing in the coming decades? Peter or Han? Yeah, I think. It really depends on the needs. Uh, how, how big is the pressure, <laughs> um, and and what is available as as technology? So these two things uh, play directly into the business case, and, and then you decide. Um, I, I guess now, if the pressure is high enough, there will be a lot of uh, chemical batteries, uh, lithium ion and redox flow, and and these things because we know they work. Uh, they have a certain cost. They have a certain value, and then you can make a decision if you want to invest or not. Huh? And if the pressure is high enough, also the, the business case gets better. Over the time, this will change. So this is a massively researched topic. All around the world, people are doing research on storage because they think it's a holy grail and it will make them famous and rich. And uh, in the next years, we will see new materials and new principles popping up. And uh, maybe some of them are disruptive. You never know. All these nanotech and graphene you, you never know what it suddenly from one day to another can have maybe a factor 10 or 20 in improvement so this is what is hidden in this material uh, research uh, always uh, you hope for this of course and um, what we will see as 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 grid people is this will be assets this will be active assets that will be, have a certain ownership that will have a certain business case they might be used for arbitrage they might be used for grid support 
we have to harmonize this, of course. Uh, these are often contradicting things. And depending on who, who owns them, uh, they, they run the show. And of course, yes, we need seasonal storage, uh, maybe on national level. Yeah? We, in, in, in summer, maybe the electricity will, will cost nothing, maybe even negative prices, because there will be so much solar for two or three months, and uh, nobody wants it. <laughs> you're punished for producing. So that's the time where we can convert in some synthetic fuels that can be stored easily in some, some steel tank and then, 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 then convert it back in, in, in winter to something that we need. But also day and night uh, with maybe chemical batteries, also flywheels and more exotic things are possible. In the end, uh, it's really a, a plain business decision. Yeah? What is, is the need? What is available as technologies? And then, then you make a decision what, what to do there. Okay, thank you. Uh, Han, if you look at, uh, at current uh, business and uh, current grid uh, um, services, do, do you as a Nexus uh, get grid services from, uh, from batteries at this moment? Uh, no, cur currently we don't. And the, the main reason for this is that uh, we, we have a, a difficulty here, which is that batteries earn money. Uh, and if we try to, uh, to affect these batteries, of course, they lose money. We have to pay for it. Now, if we have a grid congestion, the first thing we could do is to affect the battery and pay for it. But this as such does not help contracting additional customers. It solves the congestion. But the battery is more or less conge causing congestion itself, and we pay it for not doing so. So people often ask, could you um, add additional customers if you would have more batteries? But the problem here is that before the battery helps with additional customers, it is already affected by the congestion for maybe 1,000, 2,000, or 2,500 hours per year. And overall, this becomes so difficult that financially, it is very difficult to use a battery to connect additional customers, although technically it could be perfectly possible. Okay. Okay, yes. Thank you very much for the answer. Um, okay, looking at the time, we also uh, passed uh, the, the quarter past the hour, uh, which was the scheduled end time of this, uh, of this webinar. I think it was a was a, a very interesting session with also uh, interesting discussions uh, afterwards. Um, so thank you everybody uh, who stayed till the end. I see we have still uh, forty participants here. Um, <clears throat> I hope we uh, we uh, delivered you an entertaining evening uh, and also uh, some uh, some uh, provided you with some uh, some knowledge uh, that you didn't have uh, before. Um, um, yeah, special thanks to uh, the Royal Academy for inviting me to organize this, uh, this webinar. Uh, it was really a pleasure uh, to, uh, to do. Um, <clears throat> and also uh, thanks to the, um, uh, to the speakers, uh, Leonie, Peter and Han, um, for their interesting, uh, interesting talk. Um, yeah, thank you very much. I'm going to... Um, Look outside whether the electric Ferrari already has arrived. Um, um, talking about uh, time scales, um, um, yeah. And with that, I would like to uh, to thank everybody um, and wish you uh, a very nice rest of your evening.